there's people there. I mean, people in work pants and uh, like carpenters and so on. I, I understand that. I feel like I blend in with one of those. But <laughs> then you see people who are obviously should have been at work. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing, mate? It's not even summer holiday. <laughs> But then again, they're probably just pensioners. I mean, pensioners gets younger every year, it seems. So, not in this country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and the French. <laughs> <laughs> nope, you got to work until you die, and then some. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll turn you into compost and still get some use out of you. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be a. I think for you, that would be in line with your occupation so that, uh, I mean, here lies Glenn, literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome to the number one Crude Mistakes podcast with uh, Glenn from Number One Project, uh, KJ from Crude But Efficient, and myself, Howard, from Behind the Mistakes. Welcome. Another week. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Episode 30. Yeah, that's uh, who getting close to my age now in episodes. That's nice. <laughs> or is it? There's a few more to go yet, isn't there? I think so. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> You're are you forty yet? Well, uh, no, I'm I'm not close to 40, um, <laughs> depending on which side you're looking at. Well, it's, it's not that bad, but yeah, past 40 by a good margin. Very good. <laughs> so what you been up to? Do I hear some birds in the background? Did any one of you get a bird or is it actually from outside? It's from outside. It's my end. They just don't <laughs> shut up here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of nature <laughs> Chiming in. Yeah. It's trending on Twitter, I think. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'll shut up. No, go on. Tell us what you've been up to, KJ. Well, uh, I just came back from... Uh, no, I had uh, some Easter, uh, Easter break. Uh, so we went away with the family to... What's it called? Uh... Uh, adventure pool like an indoor water park uh, uh, that was really fun for the kids uh, we felt kind of soggy after a while <laughs> <laughs> walking around in water and making sure that they didn't didn't drown so that was good and fun with the, with the kids um, in the end of last week so then I, I really felt uh energized to go into the workshop in the in the weekend after that to actually get something done because just walking around and in a swimming pool that's not really that fun for me <laughs> uh, so i actually started two two new new projects uh, one is the full to tools treasure trade so i can't talk about that uh, but the other one is uh, kind of related to what we talked about in in previous episodes because uh it's a uh, rose support. Okay, <laughs> but but I'm choosing to to think of it more as a rose cage uh, because it's uh, one of those uh, goes around not, goes around. Not it, it. Nice. <laughs> well, well, it's not that shape, but yeah, you can call okay. it that, perhaps. <laughs> so it's going to be like a big bird cage. Uh, that that being said, you can talk about both projects. I'll. Uh... I'll make sure to edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> like I trust you. <laughs> so was that what the rebar was for on top of your car the other day? Yes, ah. yes. So I so I got about uh, 40 quid's worth of, of rebar and started cutting it up and uh, and uh, welded it, welded the first. Uh, it's going to be uh, hexagonal uh, in yeah. shape. So I welded up one one hex uh, space and thought, well, that works out pretty nicely. Uh, so I got some more steel. And then today I was working from home. So I took a long lunch break for about two hours <laughs> and welded up the rest of the hexagon. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, and the, the 
uh, our neighbors across the street are pensioners and they really li- like working in their garden. And they, I don't think it were happy looks they gave me when I was <laughs> welding and banging <laughs> on and <laughs> making all kind of rock rockets in the in the day. I think they they thought I should be at work or something like that. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So that was good fun. So I still smell of metal. Nice. So that feels <laughs> feels productive. <laughs> well, I uh, I did also interact with my neighbor today. I was having home office, and then uh, I saw he was outside, and I just thought, all right, I'll uh, run out and ambush him and uh, ask him some questions because we have a very large hedge between us, and I think it's two years ago now we talked about trimming it. Uh, and he wanted to join in because, I mean, he's not the kind who just sits and watch. And I didn't like the thought of being slowed down and it, it was a bad summer, so nothing ever happened. And now it's too big to do anything. So I got uh, a hold of like this alligator chainsaw for cutting down the small trees and bushes. So I just ran over and said, I got this new tool and... Um, I was thinking we could cut down some of this hedge and how far should we do it? And he has realized, like, he's getting close to 90, so he said, well, I'm not up to it. So, uh, I mean, if you feel for it, knock yourself out. (laughs) I'm now going to take advantage of that before he changes his mind. So I'm going to use the next couple of days when it's not raining to just uh, chop down as much as I can. (laughs) Fantastic. It'd be good to see the progress on that. See how you do. Yeah, might set up a time lapse for you, Glenn. And just be <laughs> yeah. like, no, what are you doing? That's not the way you do it. No, not at this season. <laughs> if you just, then I'm gonna s- sprinkle some fairy dust on it. Like, oh, it's uh, salt. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were just getting rid of it completely. Anyway, you just you're just trimming, are you? Yeah, yeah. it's a. Um, I don't know what it's called in English, but it's a, a quick growing three. Uh, tree so it grows way out of the proportion in a couple of years and if you cut it all the way down to the ground it just pops up yeah. with a lot and i thought well if if i cut down the big strands and i leave the smallest one and then i cut those down at chest height i can let everything uh, come up uh, and at a manageable height but maybe a bit denser okay. so but but by the rate this is growing and that will take just a couple of years but it's it's now stealing view from the neighbor and it's also stealing sun from ours so we have two apple trees yeah. and uh, uh, we have some bushes that has berries and so on and the one closest to the hedge actually develops fewer berries later in the season because they are in the shade for four more hours until the sun catches Gosh. up in the afternoon. <laughs> so uh, I was kind of looking forward to cutting it down. Well, if you need a hand with it, give me a shout. I'll pop over. Yeah, brilliantly. <laughs> I mean, uh, let's check the flight times here. Uh, <laughs> tomorrow or Thursday? <laughs> got anything done in the workshop, Pavard? Well, both yes and no. Um, I got the video out. Uh, another 40 minute uh, slow adventure on the hell quarter um <laughs> but I, I was but that's a short one I, I think i cut down like four hours of video where i just ranted along so just how do i cut it <laughs> to still make the conversation i have to myself like coherent in which case i would uh, like to thank you for cutting that down to 45 minutes <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I was thinking, ooh, I could upload the full uh, video to the Patreons, but I mean, that it wouldn't be a treat. That would just be a punishment, <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I like to keep them. Um, we don't need that kind of insight into your brain. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> and uh, I started pouring the concrete tabletop. So that's now curing in my workshop, and of course it needs three days to three weeks to be fully hardened so i'm now just uh, watering it every once in a while just to keep the hardening process at bay and uh, hmm? yeah it's gonna look like a table you made some legs for it yeah no but i found 
I actually chopped some legs of an oak chair a couple of years ago, and I, I still have the legs for that, and they are the exact same length. Of course, I, I would want them to be a bit beefier, but it'll do. Uh, and then I can, I can build more sturdier legs later if it turns out good. But I'm very curious on the top side. I mean, <laughs> I try to hammer out and vibrate out as much bubbles as I can, but until I flip it around and can remove the the bottom plate, I don't know how it looks like. So, of course, I can always add like five millimeter edge on top of the oak sidings, and then I can do, just use this uh, liquid leveling concrete on top of that again. So... There's always a way out of it, so uh, it look it looks good. But uh, but you're hoping to get a clean finish from the pour as it is, yeah, for the top. I managed that on a couple of tables earlier, but I was also I don't remember how much time I used tapping the sides and working out the bubbles and uh, using the rebar with the heating cable. I haven't done that before obviously so there is a possibility for a lot of air pockets and uh, things happening inside that i can't get out so i'm i'm of course i put concrete down first the first centimeter layer and then i put the rebar down so i i'm fairly sure that there is enough concrete covering the bottom plate but you never know until you remove <laughs> the mold so that's exciting <laughs> I'm probably going to do it this weekend, but I should probably wait for another week just to make sure it doesn't break. But then again, it's it's taking up my <laughs> workshop table and I can't really move it before it's cured. So, uh, but of course, I don't need the table to work on the hell quarter. I, I would have opened it up by, before now <laughs> just to check. Yeah. And of course, it's, I mean, it, it don't need to have the strength properties of a floor. So as long as it's hardened enough that you can flip it around and break the mold without ruining it, it should be fine. But I'm thinking that, okay, if I do that, I feel compelled to continue building the table and make the video. But I should also work on the next video for the hell quarter. So I'm planning on having another video out this weekend on the hell quarter and then the table will be after that i think how long is the video going to be this week don't do another 45 minutes on me hours <laughs> no <laughs> well that's the thing um <laughs> i thought this one was going to be a short one uh, <laughs> and then the next one was going to be the longer one because now everything is ready for installing the software on the computer and start programming and setting it up yeah. Uh, and trying to get some sound, so it's it's getting really interesting, and that's the video everybody has been waiting for. Uh, so I might not cut that one short. <laughs> so we'll see. I was just imagining four hours of you screaming at the computer <laughs> trying to make the programming work. Oh yeah, I'm I'm not gonna bother people with that, but yeah, oh, it's a live stream. <laughs> Yeah, maybe that's the first live stream. That would be nice. I think I think forty five minutes to cut a um, a barrel connector off, and then screw a bracket in, put the thing on the bracket, and put a screen in. It's just a bit much, mate. It's no wonder it's taking so long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at this rate, oh, the hedge yeah. is going to take three years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's going to grow faster than me cutting it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that, that video, it felt like a, a, a monologue epi version of this podcast, more or less. Yeah. <laughs> Just got so, the uh, over channel. <laughs> <laughs> so let's not do that. <laughs> no, it's, um, it's, <laughs> it's hard watching yourself for like four hours while you're cutting it down to a reasonable yeah. size and then... All right, I'm happy with this. And then, of course, you compile the video and then you do the final quality control. And, like, I can't be bothered to watch the whole 40 minutes to see if I um, did any mishaps or something. So, like, it's probably good. And then you upload it and you probably did some editing mistakes and so on. But, I mean, it is what it is. There is at least two persons that are, re like, religiously commenting, like, ooh, we like that you're posting more often and longer and so on. So to you guys. 
Love you. <laughs> <laughs> They're just tro- trolling you. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to say, how long, long a video can we get out of him, do you think? There is, there is YouTube competitors. They're the ones trying to destroy him, just encouraging you along. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and they're, they're just poking the bear. Yeah. Like, let's uh, see how, uh, how far we can <laughs> pull it before it snaps. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, the last couple of days, I have not, well, while I'm waiting for the concrete to cure, um, I've been working on another video, um, which is, is it a video where you're just compiling a lot of pictures? I'm working on the the kids book. Oh, cool! And yeah. I have, I mean, the entire book is like forty pictures. I have now converted thirty two of them, so I have like one evening left to uh, make new backgrounds for all the pictures and like the boxes to put the text in. And then, of course, I, I think I'll need some help from the wife in doing the quality control on the translation because there is a lot of. Norwegian ling- lingo in the original that doesn't translate very well to English, um, but it needs to match the <laughs> storylines of the pictures. He's got stuff like "I'm as ready as a toad" and stuff like that in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and of course, I'm not afraid to introducing the world to a new and a better <laughs> <laughs> sayings. Uh, but uh, yeah, there, there is a limit for everything. <laughs> Yeah, you need some catchphrases, but you, they can't all be catchphrases. No. Um, what was the catch? What was the phrase the other day? I'm as happy as a dodo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just a paraphrasing. The uh, dead as a dodo, so <laughs> happy as what? I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure if it was a reflection on work and like it's better off being dead. I don't know. <laughs> happy as a dodo. <laughs> Uh, so how about you glenn Uh, how's your project life coming along oh i had um i had saturday planned for the workshop all day and on friday night michelle said i'd like to go and make something in the workshop i said yeah but i want to spend saturday in the workshop she said yeah but what i want to make will only take the morning <laughs> and she was going out in the she was going out about half past five in the evening, and uh, she sat there in the morning on this little making this little lovely little rabbit. I mean, it turned out great. And at half past three, four o'clock in the afternoon, she finished, left the workshop in an absolute mess, <laughs> and went <laughs> off out for the evening. <laughs> Yeah, nice. yeah, but I got loads of stuff done. I mean, I got the house tidy. I did all the washing. <laughs> I did all the fun stuff while she played in the workshop. So yeah, it was great. <laughs> yeah, that, that's... Didn't you uh, do a project in the cakery instead <laughs> and see if, if she cleaned up the workshop, you could clean up after you or, <laughs> hey, that was, or not? I'll remember that for next time. <laughs> Yeah, then on, uh... So it was. So it wasn't this romantic. You both sitting at each end of the work <laughs> table, doing different projects, chatting, having wine. I mean, yeah. isn't that everybody's dream, or <laughs> is the workshop a getaway? <laughs> I mean, we have we do we do spend time in the workshop together, making things. But um, you know, when it's when you're trying to film a project, it's really hard to do that with somebody else in there, using machinery yeah. and you know making noise yeah. and whatnot. So, yeah. So, no, Saturday was a write-off for me. But she came up with this beautiful made rabbit that she got out on the bandsaw and then carved. Um, yeah, that looked yeah, great. For a, the lumberjack were running an Easter competition, lumberjack tools. Mm. So, uh, you know, it's in my interest if she wins. So there'll, be, there'll be a new tool in there if, it, if she does. So, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. it'll probably I be a late. <laughs> I guess she needs to ramp up her woodworking now that she's in the pocket of Rubio. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, Michelle, when's the gift bag coming? I have a birthday soon, and uh, some Rubio on my table would be nice. <laughs> I got a little bit of Rubio for my birthday, actually. I got a little sample pack, <laughs> which Michelle used on her rabbit. <laughs> Of, of course. course. <laughs> What's yours is mine. <laughs> yeah. So when is she starting a YouTube channel? 
Oh, I wish she would. I really do wish she would. I think she'd be very good at it. No, it'd be great. Wouldn't it be... Uh, how would you take it when her numbers were better than yours? I'd be absolutely fine with that. I wouldn't have a problem whatsoever. I mean, especially if she was one of the few that actually made it as a YouTuber. I mean, I'd just be living the dream, (laughs) wouldn't it? Uh, Glenn could just be tech support and being like uh, sneaking into the picture frame in the background, like, like. (laughs) (laughs) Happily edit her videos for her if she wanted. I'd be, I'd be up for all of that. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, with a new computer and uh, unlimited storage space, I mean, you could uh, switch around and become a full-time editor. Yeah, I'll do yours for you. They'll be much shorter. <laughs> <laughs> ah, easy peasy. I will send you some weekly shipments of uh, external hard drives. <laughs> <laughs> the Glenn remix of... I, I, I'm actually back there now. I, I realize I cannot... I think the last video I made have like a hundred gigs <laughs> of like raw, raw material, and then I cut it down. And I mean, am I gonna save all this? I bought a new hard drive not long ago. But it's <laughs> it's uh, filling up, yeah, relatively quickly. I've not got round to ordering the new computer yet. Um, when I was editing the podcast last week, this one was spluttering. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do all the saves I normally yeah. would. It is slowly dying. <laughs> so can you put a hard drive in the hell quarter and have, have it as a NAS or something like that? Ooh, that would be... Now that I mean, it, has it actually a has a solid state uh, hard drive, but I think it's like 128 gigs or something. So it, it's not uh, the best storage solution, but it has a relatively decent computer and it has uh, Wi-Fi and uh, all the bells and whistles, so I mean, I can have the Hellcorder on my home network and uh, remote operate it from uh, (laughs) anywhere in the world, and uh, of course I can... Have it as a backup, in in case of a fire, you just grab the Hellcorder and run. It's not going to get... I mean, with the time I put into it and the money, that's, uh, I mean, I have a box of, like, old uh, family photo albums, that's like a grab bag if anything happens, and then the Hellcorder and... (laughs) Under one arm. And then, and then the kids and the <laughs> wife. <laughs> In no particular order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not going to get anywhere near using 128 gig, is it, that little thing? No, I think it's going to use... Of course, it's like it's probably 90 gigs just running Windows 10 um, yeah. because that's a ridiculous amount of data they need. And uh, I think the... The media software is a uh, hundred, two hundred megabytes, and that's it. But then, of course, it's going to be. It's nice. I can now flick a switch, and it turns on, and the computer comes on, and it has a speaker. So, of course, with Wi-Fi and everything, Wi-Fi, um, <laughs> <laughs> I can set it up. I can u- use it as a jukebox. I can use it as a Bluetooth speaker. I mean, <laughs> it's it's going to get a lot of playtime. <laughs> It can just play through the speaker, can't it? It doesn't have to do the recorders all the time, does it? No, no. that's the yeah. that's the beauty of it. So, uh... <laughs> what would what would the behind the mistakes video catalog sound through the Hellcorder <laughs> with, the, <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> with the flutes initiated? I actually that that is a plan of mine when I'm going to make the final <laughs> video. I was going to do like the Inception kind of things where you have the video. <laughs> And then you zoom out, and of course that video is playing on the screen on the hell quarter. Oh, cool. <laughs> so that's going to need some trickery to pull off. Um, so that will be cool. Love it. But then, of course, with all the apps you can download, I mean, you can uh, you can use it as an alarm clock, and then you can have it play any <laughs> song on the recorders. Um, of course, I already have a, a recorder-based alarm clock, and my wife said that uh, if it came inside the house, you could just rename it the divorce, because that's, <laughs> that's going to be the result. So I don't think bringing the helicopter into the bedroom would help in that situation. <laughs> I mean, it's a good thing if it if it starts just playing through the speaker, and you know that you have 30 seconds to get out of bed and turn it off until the recorder starts. That's... Oh, that's good. 
I need it need a snooze button. All right, I I need to go to AliExpress and order me some buttons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what will you do when you're done with this this version of it? I have a few ideas for like sprinkling in, but I don't think that will just be like icing on the cake uh randomly, but uh, I do have the uh, I now have the guitar I need. Uh, I have the MIDI, my audio to MIDI board from the original one. So I just need a bagpipe and I have a compressor. So I have everything. So that's the bag no one ever. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the bagpipe guitar is going to happen. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to, that's going to be a nice project that's going to be done relatively quickly. And of course, I know I said that about the first health quarter and here we are yeah, 10 yeah. years later. <laughs> I'm talking about projects done quickly. I had a day in the workshop today. I got in the workshop about 11 o'clock this morning and uh, I finished my next project in a day. It's fantastic. Oh, that's not, that's a good feeling. Yeah, that it is. really is. Yeah, if we'd not been doing the podcast, I'm, and my, this computer was up to it, I probably would have got it edited tonight as well. <laughs> But now I've, nice. I've got the uh, diddly bow done. Hmm. Uh, great from making that today. Yeah, I love the video snippets and uh, <laughs> the pictures. That's uh, going to be a really nice video. You... Yeah, I mean, it sounded good with you. <laughs> with it, so. Yeah, even yeah. <laughs> well, my uh, my daughter's uh, been over at Steve's today because uh, she goes to school with his daughter, and. Um, I went to pick her up and had just finished the diddly bow in time, so I've actually dropped it off with Steve and said, bring, oh. have a play with this, bring it back over on Saturday, and um, I'll record you playing it. <laughs> so, yeah, looking forward to that, seeing what he gets out of it. I literally just tightened up the string. I've not tried tuning it or anything. So, yeah, but no, pleased with it. It's very, very uh, – it picks up all the noise, that pickup that I put in it. <laughs> <laughs> I um... – I think it was the, the 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 last no second to last guitar I built. You have like uh, I mean, I guess all mics are electric, but I actually splurged and bought the, these uh, active pickups, and they pick up no noise. Everything is like removed, so if you don't touch the strings, it doesn't make a sound at all. Right. So it's almost weird. So that's uh. <laughs> That's really nice. But I'm not sure. Do you have any cavities in the body of it? I mean, uh, because you do often line it with uh, some foil to help with the hum. Or I even bought this uh, actually conductive paint that I use to paint the cavities inside the guitar to help oh, okay. shield it from uh, mm. uh, electric interference yeah. and so on. Well, this one doesn't hum, actually, unless you put it too close to the amp, which I think most guitars do, don't they? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's yeah. unavoidable, yeah. no matter what but, guitar. Yeah, no, there's no harm. I mean, it just doesn't matter where you... If you just gently touch it on the strings, it's making a noise, that one. <laughs> yeah. So it's got All right, we can do it. We can do a, do a swap. If uh, you can score me some Rubio, I can give you some uh, conductive uh, shielding <laughs> paint for guitars. <laughs> uh, you're talking to the wrong person. You'll have to, uh, have to talk to the missus. I think you're going to have to come up with something better than conductive material for guitars for her, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll have a chat. Uh, <laughs> Michelle, I'll DM you later. <laughs> <laughs> later on Saturday night when this comes out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or Sunday morning. <laughs> Whatever comes first, yeah. <laughs> So KJ, what was that's nice? What were those weird bracket things you bought? What was all that about? You got a special bracket for your pipes. What was special about it? Yeah, yeah, the, no, yeah, I made that one from uh, from uh, uh, plate steel because uh, uh, yeah, when we renovated uh, our kitchen, we got uh, another sink installed. Uh, so then the the plumber uh, put some new pipes in and. The boiler room is just uh, underneath the kitchen, so all the pipes go in the in the just under the ceiling of the boiler room. And he he said, "Ah, it's going to be fine. Just the 
with not that much uh, thing supporting the pipes. And I thought, oh, it looks kind of... Uh, but I, I really would like to support them better. But I, n- I never got around to it. And now it's like four years later. <laughs> and so probably it was fine <laughs> all along. But it still feels good to to uh, uh, to get it more properly done. But since the, the ceiling is uh, asbestos, I, I'm not so keen on trying to drill into it. Yeah. Both because it's not good for you and because it's hard like rock, because it basically is. So, <laughs> uh, so I just uh, try and extended one of the holders for the pipes that was close to it and balanced it on one of the supports holding up the roof or uh, the ceiling, I mean. Uh, so I had to make a special bracket and, and uh, bend it uh the just the right amount and fiddle it in and try to make it fit which was a lot of uh, putting it in trying taking it out <laughs> and fiddling with it and and uh, re- realize how much uh, of a distance the the screws need to be not to pull on the pipes too much and hold them tight and that sort of thing but it just felt really good getting it done so now I'm I'm probably gonna finish the finish the insulation of all the pipes as well, so we don't leak as much heat down in the in the boiler room as we do at the moment. But that kind of surprised me because I didn't think your house was that old that you actually got uh, asbestos in it. Yeah, it's uh, like a hundred and ten, twelve, something like that. Oh yeah, that's the oldest old parts. Enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's that's really funny because uh, when we moved in here, there were some pipes that were insulated and it, it really looked like asbestos. And I was really like, oh, crap, <laughs> because that really adds up when you do a renovation. And um, I took some samples and sent in and got tested and it turned out it wasn't. So I was really pleased. So I could just yank everything out and cut it down, which was really nice. Um and of course, at my a previous employer, um, uh, they actually are uh, one of the. There are several countries involved, but um, like the the islands on South Georgia, you have some old whaling stations there and some remains that are protected. So, uh, roughly once a year, they have a delegation that go down there and uh, do some maintenance, repair, and so on. And of course, at that stage, they used asbestos in basically everything. So. <laughs> now you need to have this full body suit and respirator and everything if you're just going into some of the houses and fabrics that are factories that are standing there. And one of my colleagues that's actually uh, responsible for following this work up, and she was asking the people, like, do I need to wear one of these suits? Can't I just wear my normal clothes? <laughs> and they said, no, but... I mean, it's asbestos. It's it takes roughly thirty years of ex, like exposure before you develop signs and of various kinds of cancer. And I'm seventy. <laughs> I'm not gonna live until I'm a hundred. Can't I take this risk? No, no, no. You cannot. <laughs> and of course, uh, there is always the random environmentalist uh, contacting. Uh, uh, this department and uh, thinking about all the animals and uh, then you have asbestos down there and of course you have free roaming animals going in and out of the building and i mean there's not an animal <laughs> in the arctic that lives more than eight years and of course you need to be exposed for nearly 30 so she just, she just laughs at them and hangs up <laughs> so it's really fun so uh, yeah asbestos is great fun to work with <laughs> Okay, I thought you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just thinking, but you know, the only animal living a long time in that part of the world, or oh, what's it called in English? That shark. Uh, it's called hårskärring in Swedish, at least. It's the Greenland shark, perhaps it is. Yeah. Okay. That 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 becomes like four hundred years old or something oh, wow. like that. But I don't. It's very seldom that you find those roaming around in buildings on land. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, the, the exposure time there is minimal, I think. 
I think it's neglectable, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's it's really interesting because that's that's a place I really want to go someday. And of course, Norway also have uh, the most remote island ever, and it, it's in, it's down there. Um, uh, it's called the Bouvet Island, and it's basically a lump of ice that's inaccessible unless you have a vessel with a helicopter. And I, I want to go there and I want to explore, uh, but of course I want to I want to go go ashore there and, and spend a couple of weeks uh, just uh, walking around the exploring and there are cruise lines that go down there um but then it's more like uh, american cruises where they have a guide and you all have to go like uh ducks in a row and then you are a few hours on shore and then you go back to the cruise ship and you head back home and i think the cruise line ticket is around ten thousand dollars and then of course you have to go to argentina to get on the cruise line so it's basically a twenty thousand (laughs) dollar ordeal just to spend a few hours there Uh, so the only way is actually to get there with your private sailboat uh, which i don't have at the moment and it it takes quite a while to get (laughs) there and then of course you need the appropriate permits to be allowed to go there um and of course, working with that uh, directorate who actually worked on protecting these sites, um, I know the people that are involved in giving people the licenses and actually knowing how to behave and what to do and what to not do. I'm fairly certain that I could get an application through. But of course, the the, the leader of that committee is now, well, she was 70 years, six years ago. So, I mean, it's... The maths doesn't add up because uh, me being a small time parent now, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be quite a few years before I can schedule in a half hour, no, half year sail to go on an expedition. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure she's not going to be around by then. It sounds like an awful thing to do. I'd rather have two weeks in Greece. Yeah, that as well, but you can easily fly there for a couple of hundred yeah. quids, but... Uh, there is something about the remote places and it's also abandoned. So you have like these whaling vessels that are just beached and rusting away. You have old factories in basically the most remote place you can think of. And of course, I like to go places where there aren't any tourists. So unless you are there when that cruise ship arrives, you're basically left to your own devices, which is kind of cool. And, of yeah. course, I'm a Norwegian, so, of course, I, I like to spend my <laughs> vacations in uh, cold and freezing and remote yeah. places <laughs> and I'm pay pretty, money for it. I'm pretty sure you've just spent all winter moaning about the cold and the dark. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just a coping mechanism, isn't it? <laughs> that's just how we're built. Yeah. Does the moaning help keep you warm? <laughs> Uh, it helps it a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. Builds the hard, hard liquor. Heat from the inside. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the cold and the dark, how's the weather in in Norway at the moment? Do we do we have spring at the moment? Oh, we had spring. We actually had some flowers popping up, and um, the green grass is uh, trying to push through. And then. We had the 30 centimeters to half a meter of snow overnight, <laughs> but of course that that is now melted and rained away. So, so it's nice. I think we have 14, 15 degrees outside. Uh, it's going to get close to 18 by the end of the weekend, but it is raining and the ground is sogging wet. So trying to do anything is basically impossible. Okay. Yeah, so. I think we have the the nice weather. <laughs> Your weekend weather, we have a right. Right at the moment, because I think we were closer to close to twenty degrees uh, today. It felt really, it felt kind of cool standing outside welding, knowing that the sun is powering my my solar panels and powering the welder. So I am basically fusing metal together with the power of the sun. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's More that's, that's cool. instantly. That's, that's re- really interesting. We had uh, twenty degrees on Saturday, so it's obviously. I'll, I'll give you a heads up when the warm weather's coming again, shall I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do. <laughs> it seems like it's going yeah. in a, you know, some kind of... 
I mean, not not to shamelessly uh, plug the news, but uh, my birthday's coming up, and I've just let everyone in the family know that if they're planning an anything remotely uh, close to a gift, I want a gift card for a specific shop because uh, I'm now going to order the welder, uh, and uh, this uh, store actually sells its small size. Um, gas bottles that you can just swap out and get refilled so that's uh, on my list and i'm gonna build like the welding table i now have the wheels and everything so uh i really feel it now when the wa- the warm weather is you know, like showering over us i have that stainless steel water tank just sitting outside waiting for me so it's uh it's gonna be a nice summer I'm gonna get a lot of welding <laughs> done i'm not sure what i'm gonna build yet but uh it's going to get the welded the crap out of it. <laughs> it's a funny thing. When the, the sun comes out, you get energized and want to go outside and do stuff. It's, yeah, yeah, actually, when I poured the concrete, this was the first day this year that I had the garage door uh, wide open while going in and out and mixing concrete and so on. And it's, I mean, it's beautiful. I think in my dream workshop, however big it is, it's going to have a wall that you can completely open towards the the south side so you can have like sunshine just uh, hitting you in the face while you're in the workshop. There is basically no better feeling. I think you need it west. I mean, that you can do it with your clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> west, then again, being naked facing. in a workshop is nice, but of course, doing uh, YouTube videos, it's a, it's a sure way of getting demonetized. So I, tr- I try to keep it to a minimum. <laughs> well, that depends on what you're doing in the workshop as well. I mean, I would be, would it be grinding uh, in the nude, I think? Well, it's hard grinding with clothes on as well. I mean, oh, you're talking about That's that kind of grinding. Kind of okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> those were the oh, days. Okay, yeah. So did you watch Havard's video at full speed or did you speed it up? No. Uh, I watch most everything at, at at least yeah, one and a half. Some uh, a bit slower. Does everything make sense at we one did- and a half? Yeah, I mean it's uh, the the compression algorithm is really good at making everything sound sound decent. Uh, so okay, yeah, and I, I mean I'm so used to it that I feel like people are really slow <laughs> if I don't. You find real life just really <laughs> slow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's I mean that's great when you. Uh, uh, like at Make the Central, meeting people in real life, then I got uh, a lot more uh, time to think when people oh, are God, yeah. speaking yeah, yeah, yeah. to me because they're talking so slow. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, life hack. <laughs> so, given your postage system, have you uh, sent Havard anything for his birthday yet? Uh, no. Nope. <laughs> But, I wasn't even aware that it was his birthday. That it's already too late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shit at keeping track of people's <laughs> days uh, for for some reason. I mean, I'm really good at at using a calendar and keeping track of stuff, but for some reason, yeah, people's special days they just don't they don't stick for some reason. I'm no, I'm no good with um, family, but random podcast friends and stuff like that. I'm pretty good at that one. <laughs> Is that a good thing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, um, good for the podcast friends. <laughs> one, of, one of my former colleagues, uh, I, I shared a, a room with him for like seven years or something yeah. like that. Uh, and uh, so he was uh, often ta- taking some private calls while at work. Uh, and so in that time, I learned his social security number. <laughs> by heart. So his is the only one I know totally, uh, uh, except my own. I don't, I, I can't tell 
I I kind of know my kids, but I'm not sure. Right? I don't know my wife's, but I know his. <laughs> it's so that's so, sorry, yeah. guys. I just I just came into the conversation, and without knowing the prequel, I'm going to follow up on this because I have some ideas, <laughs> 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 and uh, I think someone was in the same situation here in Norway. And it's it's very easy to change your name. You can do everything online. So you you just need to know your uh, social security number. And today you have like uh, this stu- two stage verification, but at some point it wasn't that complicated. So uh, if you if you knew enough, you could just log on and change people's name, and then someone actually did that to a friend. And of course, it it took for a few months, and then of course he went to the bank in some official business and like like they put in his uh, like social security number and it's like. But your name is not. I mean, your name is like uh, like a uh, hurdy bagurdy bagurdy. It's like, no, that's not my name. Well, it says here. It's uh, in the official registry. <laughs> <laughs> that's so mean, but so fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the really fun thing is, it's of course, it's easy to change it back again. But there is actually a limit of how many times you can do it. And ah, yeah. uh, someone else, of course, when, when this became readily available, people changed their names at parties and so on just for fun. And then, of course, they woke up one day and they tried to change it back again and they, like, they've hit the limit. <laughs> and then it's a, it's a real bureaucracy. to like uh, You have to apply and you have to argue why you should be allowed to change it back again. It's like, oh, yeah, it was drunk on Friday. I thought it would be fun to be called uh, something, something. Um, and, of course, it's the... I don't know how you translate this to English, but in Norway, it's it's, it's called the People Registry. It's a, it's a, like a, a governmental agency who oversees the, well, basically the registry of all the Norwegians. Uh, and uh, of course, it's it's the same. When you have a child, they fill out the form. And this gets submitted uh, today. It's digitally. Uh, it's this directorate to actually give you your social security number and register you. So, all right, we have a newborn Norwegian and they get you into the system. And of course, I also know that this department also work with the police uh, with regards to people that need a new identity for security reasons. So they can actually give people new social security numbers, new name, whatnot. So I could not help myself. So I I sent them a letter um, where I said, uh, hello, and I presented myself, full name and everything. And of course, I'm I'm not in a witness protection program or anything, but of course, I would like to change my social security number. I don't care about the last digit, but the birth year, like I would like to change it from 1982 to 1992 because I don't feel like I'm 40. I feel more like I'm 30, and I want the number to reflect that. And could you help me with that? <laughs> and, of course, it's a win-win. The number would match how I feel and how I look. And, of course, that would also make me look? having to... <laughs> Fuck you. <guys. laughs> Okay, maybe I need to shave, but then again. <laughs> and of course, that would make me have to work 10 more extra. And that's a bonus for the state because that's 10 years extra of added taxes. And of course, it's honest, it's going to be 10 years of me being a pensioner, which is also a win-win. And of course, this being a governmental department and I working in one myself, I know that they are obliged to actually write you a proper answer. So that's one of the reasons why I did it, because it's a ridiculous request, but they are <laughs> obliged to keep this as a real request. So I got a letter back that, oh, thank you for your uh, letter. And uh, although we understand your reasoning, this uh, is outside of your jurisdiction and we can't do that. And of course, I ended it with that. Of course, I could have kept that uh, conversations going with them back and forth because that's the nice uh, thing about any department in Norway and the the government, they are obliged to give you an answer. So you you can keep a conversation going for years. (laughs) (laughs) 
hopefully you made someone smile at least that day. Or yeah, I think someone had a great day, and hopefully I uh, that letter is on a wall somewhere in a gray large building in the capital. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be more like that person was having a really crap week and then they got your letter and they're like, oh, Jesus Christ, not this again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, don't, you don't have more fun than you can actually generate yourself. That's a, that's a saying in Norwegian. The famous phrase saying. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Norwegians, uh, I, I actually learned uh, a couple of days or maybe a week ago or something that it actually was Norwegians who invented salmon sushi. Yep, that's actually true. That you yeah. th- we, everyone thinks that that's a strictly Japanese thing, but it was actually because of uh, Norwegian salesmen who actually made the Japanese buy a shitload of salmon and make make that the new sushi thing in like the 70s yeah, or uh, 80s or something like that? I, well, of course, I, I now work in the aquaculture business. So I've uh, I've been in the same room with some of the people who actually fronted Norwegian salmon towards the, uh, the sushi industry. And the reason for that is that you, you have salmon in the Pacific as well, but they have a certain type of, of parasite uh, where they need to actually cook or prepare the salmon uh, from the Pacific oh, okay. Ocean. So you can't really serve it raw. So that's why it, is, it has never been a part of traditional sushi. And then some bright Norwegian thought that, well, our salmon don't have that parasite. And of course, there's a huge market. And they were quite early on spotting that sushi is now getting like a world phenomenon. So they actually had a delegation going down there and working really hard to selling this to the Japanese, and they actually pulled it off. So yeah, wasn't it that you you started the, the fish farms as well that worked really well, and you had a shitload of salmon you wanted to to, to sell to the world? Yeah, uh, that, 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 the is, uh, thing. that is well. It, it was a business venture. They wanted to expand because they saw they could produce a lot of salmon, and of course they. If they could create a larger market, then they could expand the the fish farming industry in Norway uh, more rapidly. And of course, today, they are at the stage that you don't have enough fjords with enough uh, quality and uh, environmental properties to actually produce more salmon. So that's that's what I'm doing now. We're looking at the initiative of actually moving fish farms offshore in harsher environments, but away from the coast because in the early 60s, 70s, when this started being a thing in Norway, there was no regulation. So everybody started doing it uh, in all kinds of fjords. (laughs) And of course, if one operator got a problem with the sickness, of course, this spread to the neighboring fjord and they had a problem and there's no regulations and of course, there is really hard to get a politician today that can actually go and say that, all right, you can't operate anymore. You can't operate anymore because we need to restructure the way we think. So there's there's a lot of challenges in like the coastal fish farms in Norway because we don't have enough space and they are limited in getting licenses for expansion because there is a issue with like lice and biologic biological like uh, disease spreading and so on. So, um, yeah, we are at a milestone now, I think, where it starts to pivot. Cod has a parasite as well, doesn't it? I think a lot of fish actually yeah. have uh, like a symbiotic relationship with a parasite or another. And then, of course, some of them are, I mean, relatively harmless, but it's not fun finding that in your food, uh, no. at <laughs> least if you're eating it raw. But, of course, most of them... Of course, it's relatively harmless once you cook or fry the fish, but still. Yeah, well, it's not a nice thought, is it? <laughs> no, <laughs> you just don't. You don't want to t- think about all the parasites and bacteria and microorganisms and things living <laughs> on us, in us, everywhere, all the time. <laughs> the, same, um, the same when you get always. Sorry, the same when you get you buy a bag of salad in that industry. There's, they're allowed to have so many aphids or. 
um, yeah. snails in there, aren't they, per bag? It's just ridiculous. I should be allowed to have none. <laughs> yeah. It's a measurable percentile yeah. or something like that with how much but that, that's, insects. And, yeah. It's really fun. After I went out of high school, I worked in aquaculture. And then, of course, I started studying. And then I went into the maritime industry. And now I'm back in the aquaculture industry. And everything has been something related to the maritime environment. So every conference I'm on, every meeting we have, every workshop, there is always seafood because we work in the maritime industry. And of course we have to serve seafood. <laughs> and if I could choose, I'm a beef and sausage man. <laughs> so it's like, oh, God damn it. Yes, I, w I work with aquaculture and I find the technical challenges uh, interesting, but... <laughs> I don't want to eat it. <laughs> How do you feel so, talk, yeah. talking about it in the podcast now, then? I mean, you guys love to well, bring I, up gardening every once in a while for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it, it's fine. And I, I do enjoy seafood, but I mean, it's uh, not five days a week. I try to keep a balanced uh, like diet, but... Uh, <laughs> If I can choose, I mean, if we are having a date night and we don't, well, we, we have been out for sushi, but if, if I get to choose, then there is some meat derivative on the plate. <laughs> <laughs> you can always go vegetarian. Yeah, At that least is for well the conferences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing. There is a couple of dishes that, that I like that are uh, vegetarian, but they are seldom served at the uh, conferences and so on. I mean, like this mass produced, uh, it, it's, it's hard finding a vegetarian alternative uh, at a conference <laughs> that is actually <laughs> decent on taste. So, yeah. 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 That's a really, it's a dice game with, with a dice loaded against you, I think. Yeah. <coughs> I live with two vegetarians though. So I, I I can't speak for them. There is some nice vegetarian food. It's just better as a side if you're a meat eater. That's the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's why you're sucking down Bovril all that's the time. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah you've got to get those meaty oh, flavours in somewhere. <laughs> a childhood friend of mine um, was visiting his older brother and he was dating a vegetarian at some point and this was she had separate cutlery oh. and everything. And of course he didn't think about that. So he was visiting one weekend and he was going to like make breakfast for everyone. So he actually uh, cut some bacon and fried and some eggs and something. And then like she came in, you used my knives. And this was also like expensive knives and whatnot. And <laughs> yeah, but you can just wash them. Nope. She had to throw them away, so they they actually sold them because she could never use them. I mean, yeah, it was that level. That's extreme. And, <laughs> yeah, but to say that they're not together anymore, and uh, <laughs> that was maybe for the better. <laughs> so, yeah. That's that's really extreme. And then I'm, I mean, at that level, why are you dating someone that actually is not a vegetarian? Because that's the level where you. Uh, I mean, you have to contaminate your house or separate it and live in a bubble, basically. Yeah. There's some key things you sh probably should agree on if you're going to have a relationship. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of them. I mean, the sex need to be really good for that to work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's possible. I was just thinking, what, what, extent, <laughs> what extent vegetarian wash you with the meat? <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> so this is where i'm gonna put in the bling sound and we change topic <laughs> <laughs> i've started learning the cigar box guitar oh nice how's it going? uh yesterday oh. i watched a, a youtube video a cigar box for ultra beginners <laughs> and apparently there should nice. be there should be a level below that <laughs> <laughs> so he, he was, you heard it here yeah. first, but next year, Maker Central, there's going to be a dueling banjos with number one project on the cigar box. Uh, and then uh, 
I'm going to join in with the hell quarter. <laughs> you have to be there to see it. It's going to be a one-time occurrence. VIP tickets can be sold separately. DM us. Considering the, <laughs> the weight of the instrument, that sort of thing, shouldn't Scopper Festival be a better location for it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was kind of hoping that maybe uh, the <laughs> Maker Central could uh, arrange <laughs> to, to ah, be in Norway yeah. next year. <laughs> Just <laughs> <laughs> a merger, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if I were to move it over to Britain, it would change the magnetic North Pole and the center of gravity of Earth. So uh, yeah, it would be. <laughs> it's, it's better to move the festival here. <laughs> The guy on the uh, video was saying, "All you need to do is to be able to is be able to count to four. And I'm thinking, I can count to four. One, two, three, four. I see, I can do it. But then <laughs> he was doing, and then you have to add the word and. So it's one and two and three and four. And I'm thinking, well, he's doing an upstroke there, so that's seven. So I've got to count to seven now. And then I'm looking at his left hand." And trying to count the frets where his fingers are at that particular point, and I could not do it. It's too much counting going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I remember I, I at a very young age, I, I was learning the guitar, and of course, I was trying all kinds of music. And then, of course, my 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 go to band has always been Pink Floyd since as early as I can remember. And I remember an interview with David Gilmour, the lead guitarist, and he said at one point that I, I couldn't play fast to save my life. And then I remember it was an epiphany because, wow, that's that's the one guitarist I'm really idolizing. And he says that he couldn't play Metallica even if he wanted to because he's not set up for it. And then I realized, all right, I don't have to change all these fast pacing licks because that is cool. I can just find my own pace. Yeah. And uh, of course, the same with uh, like the, the lead guitarist of Dire Straits. He said something in the lines of, well, if a guitar teacher ever saw me play, he would pull his hair out because my technique <laughs> is self-taught. But I mean, he, he creates some of the most yeah. uh, beautiful uh, music ever. So... I don't think you have to be able to count. No. I mean, if you can, if you can count the two, that's more than enough, and you can fuck with the ants and just play, <laughs> yeah. just make some sounds. That's well, what it's all about. That's exactly <laughs> what I did. I picked it up again this morning and um, actually played a note on it, and then played another note, and the two went together really well. And before I knew it, I'd got about seven or eight notes together. So I've got the start of something. I'm thinking this is the way I'm going to have to do this. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that's... I think that's one of the problems that I had at an early stage, at least in school. Because a lot of the people like teaching music, they are classically trained and they usually learn the notes and all the theory, and then maybe you can start with a simple instrument like the recorder, and you should learn to like play single notes, and then you could add on to that, and you might play a tune. And of course, we were all sitting there, and we want to play guitar, and we want to play uh, an Angus Young riff or something yeah. like that, and then... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's maybe a couple of years down the line. First, you have to learn this and you have to learn to count and then you have to have a metronome. And you're killing the joy of music before people even get to start and on crappy instruments. So I've always said to friends that have kids that want to play something, the best thing you can do, buy them a proper guitar. I mean, there's nothing worse than having a crappy cheap instrument to play on because it will never sound good. And then if it doesn't work out, you can sell it. If you buy the cheapest option, you will have to throw it away because nobody's going to buy that. And I had a friend of my dad, which actually learned his first chords from my dad and he became a really decent guitar player. And then my father said, well, can you teach my son because he wants to learn some of the music that you play? 
and he had that approach that like, okay, but what songs do you like? What do you want to play? And then we start that and then we can explain what's the theory behind it afterwards. And that's a much better approach. I mean, yeah. just start to play and <laughs> yeah. then the, the theory will come later. But I think that's a, that's a thorn in my side to the music teaching industry that they are approaching this all wrong i mean kids at 10 to 15 years old they're not built to sit quietly and learn theory i mean start to play and learn by doing and it's basically what i'm doing today (laughs) in the making scene i mean how hard can it be just start doing it and then Oh, there is something called welding theory. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's be- oh, so that's why it's working when I'm doing this. Oh, that's nice, cool. <laughs> so uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that uh, that's in everything. You have to you have to have a, a why before you you start. Yeah. Otherwise, the things you learn won't stick. It's it's the same with everything. Uh, I think. I, I mean, I felt that at least, but learning math. Some parts were really boring. Why would I ever need this? And then when you actually get a practical application of that specific thing, that's, wow, this is awesome. Yeah. But then but why didn't I learn this uh, two years ago when I was supposed to? Well, because it was boring and I didn't, de- didn't see a purpose for it. Oh, we had, so, uh, yeah. I almost failed uh, a math class in high school for that same reason, because I did not see the practical use. But luckily, uh, the teacher got uh, sick leave for a couple of weeks before the exam. And then the substitute was a physics teacher. And of course, he related all the mathematics that we were going to learn to actually physical experiments. And then I just, oh, so there's actually a practical use for this. (laughs) Brilliant. I can actually use it to calculate interference or whatever. And it's like... And I passed, and I had the same in university as well. We had a few math teachers there that they should have been, to be honest, one of them should have been put down years ago. Um, (laughs) And of course, no practical use whatsoever, but I I managed to pass, well, well, not his class, of course, because I I told him off in front of 400 students, uh, but... uh, um, we also had some uh, teachers in engineering and so on who actually said that, uh, okay, but you can actually use this math to solve this problem. I mean, you can do it in five minutes on a computer today, but you could also use half a year and do it this way. And they that actually made me pass uh, there as well of having some practical application. And I think that's when I realized that I need to learn theory through actually doing something. I can't just sit in a room and being told something. Yeah. I have to see the, the purpose. Yeah. Otherwise it feels, it feels wasted. So if someone could have made me realize that when I was 12, I would probably be a much more pleasant student for all the teachers. So <laughs> if any one of you are listening, it's like, uh, I wasn't a problem child. I was just, I wanted answers <laughs> <laughs> and a purpose. <laughs> All right. The first uh, awkward silence of the night, and we are at <gasps> that's one hour. This is actually a natural <laughs> ending point. Yeah. Brilliant. Sounds like it. So thank you guys for listening. It's been a great episode. It's been a cheerful one. It's been a great week. Spring is coming and uh, you're all getting all giddy and uh, feeling young again. So um, see you on the next episode or if you're feeling uh, up for it, there's probably going to be a half pint here down the line somewhere. But no guarantees. Goodbye. Bye. No guarantees. Bye. Bye.